super, super honored to be with you guys. Uh, I am in my first year of my doctoral program, and so uh, I was studying all day. Uh, got a 20-page paper due next week, and uh, I, I will be in class all mornings, Monday through Wednesday, and then I'll be hanging out with y'all at night. And uh, man, can I just say, um, I'm good, there we go. You can tell that the, this church has been like just soaked in the Holy Spirit the past couple of weeks or months. I don't, I don't know how long you guys have been in this Fresh Wind series, but it feels good in here. It just feels good in the room. And um, I think sometimes we have to be reminded that the church is the bride of Christ. I should get a good amen right there. Not a 501c3 that you get a charitable write off from. Not just an organization. Not just some impersonal, not a building, but a bride. A bride. Like when, when Jesus wanted to communicate, how we're supposed to feel about the church? Come on, he said, yeah, this is my boo. Like, this is my girl right here. Like, it's my bride. Uh, it's funny, my wife, we've been married for seven years, okay? Seven years, went through about five years of infertility, and my wife's eight months pregnant with our miracle baby right now. Eight months pregnant. It's crazy, crazy. Um, and we'll talk about that all throughout the week, and... Um, but I remember we were, we were newlyweds, and my wife had, like, one job for me. Like, come on, any wife can, you can relate. Just, like, one job. My wife made it very clear. I don't want to take out the trash. She was like, hey, homeboy, I'll cook. <laughs> like, I'll make sure I do the laundry. Like, my wife's like, hey, I got you. But look, buddy, I don't want to fill up my car with gas, <laughs> and I don't want to take out the trash. Like, I just, that's my girl right there. Hey. It's my hot chocolate mama Cita right there. Mm. Um, anyway, okay, sorry. Uh, and so uh, my, my wife is like, hey, your job is to take out the trash, okay? Um, I, got, I got a bunch of other chores around the house. Your job is to take out the trash. And you know, come on, I don't know if anybody remembers being a new husband. For whatever reason, remembering to take out the trash continued to like evade my mind. Like, just kept forgetting to take out the trash. And uh, I remember one day, we were probably like six months into marriage. And my wife pulled like an advanced wife move right here. So I'm offering marriage advice and uh, spiritual advice, okay? <laughs> my wife comes in the house and she's like, babe, thanks for taking out the trash. And I'm like, this woman's playing Jedi mind tricks on me. Like, I don't, I don't know what's going on. And she's like, looking at you like when you take out the trash your biceps be kind of flexing and you look good when you take the trash out and I'm sitting there I'm on the couch in the living room just kind of like I don't know what's going on you know I look over at the trash and I'm like I have not taken out any trash and my wife continues she's like boy I just want to say thank you like, I, I've noticed, I've just noticed the difference when you take out the trash. You want to know what's crazy? As soon as she walked into the room, like in, out of the living room, into the bed, I was like, let me go, let me go take this trash out. <laughs> because men are motivated by praise. Proverbs actually says this, it's better a man would rather be on the top of a house than inside of that house with a nagging woman. You want to know the question that the bride of Christ always has to ask? Are we a nag? Or are we thanking God in advance for all of the things that he hasn't even done yet? Because if you know how to talk to God, oh, a church can get a lot out of God if you actually know how to approach him, how to whisper into his ear. See, when we begin to say, God, you're a healer, even though there are congregants in the hospital, we're praising you for your healing power. We're saying, I'm not coming to church to nag you or to remind you of all the things you haven't done. I'm here to worship you and to thank you and to praise you. That's what a good bride does. Hello? I need a better amen than that. Amen. That's what a good bride does. A good bride doesn't nag. When are you going to take the trash out? <laughs> When are you going to take the trash out? 
And some of, we always, to the church, Jesus' church, we continually have to take a pulse. Are we nagging God? Are we nagging God? When we come together, are we nagging him? Or are we saying, God, I know what you can do. I know what you can do. Five years of infertility, me and my wife, five years. And you know what? After a while, Pastor Jeff, I just decided I'm not going to ask God to do this anymore. I'm just going to start thanking him that on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. It is done. When Jesus said, it is done on the cross, that meant that I'm already a dad. I'm already a father. Five years ago, I was a dad. And I started thanking God for it five years ago. So when I looked at an ultrasound and saw a heartbeat for the first time, it was just the first time that my reality caught up to the worship that I'd already been giving God for all the things that I'd already been expecting of him I'm just not gonna nag God not gonna be a nagging bride and as I just st stood over there and just kind of sensed the atmosphere just felt like God was just like I like being in this room there's worship in this room there's praise in this room and oh, a church that knows how to talk to me oh oh nothing like a church that knows how to talk to God and maybe right now, as you're sitting down, this is a heart check. Are you waiting for like your miracle to come through before you really give God like exuberant worship and praise? Or have you decided, no, nah, I'll worship him, not for what he does, but for who he is. If he never does another thing for me, Come on, God, you've done enough. You woke me up this morning. You filled my lungs with air. There's blood flowing through my veins. God, you've redeemed me. You've rescued me. God, you've sanctified me. God, I should have lost my mind a long time ago, but for whatever reason, you've surrounded me with your peace. And God, yes, there are some things that I'm waiting on you for, but I, may, I dare not get upset in the waiting room and get an attitude and be so attitude he spoiled child about all the things that I want you to do God there are some things I'm hoping praying wishing I'm in faith for but let me just go ahead and praise you and worship you God thank you for the dangers you've kept me from seen and unseen God thank you thank you thank you I wonder is there anybody with a thank you in your heart oh come on God thank you we worship you there's nobody like you God, thank you for your presence. God, thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We love you, Jesus. Oh, he's been faithful. Okay, hey, my name's Manny Arango. <laughs> Super excited to be with you guys. Uh, I don't know who was here the Sunday that I preached back in February. It was like negative 1,000 degrees outside, okay? So I'm so happy that you invited me back in June. Oh, man, it feels great. Iowa was a different place in June, you know? Uh, the, you know, all throughout the weekend that I was here in February, the guys, they were dropping me off right here at the front. I, I don't have a coat. I'm from North Carolina. I'm like, coat? Why would I have a coat? What is that? And so they were dropping me off right here. Today, we rolled up to the property, and August asked me, hey, man, you want me to drop you off like a diva? Uh, or he didn't say like, he didn't say that. <laughs> He's like, do you want me to drop you off, or do you want me to park and we can walk in together? I said, August, it's like 90 degrees my man the only reason you were dropping me off last time is because I was scared I was gonna get frostbite from the parking lot to the church so I'm very happy that I'm back in June and I'm super excited for what God's gonna do this week I'm full of expectation for what God is gonna do this week this is rare that a church would schedule out five nights like of just time to soak and saturate in the presence of God so I just want to honor your church, for real. And uh, Pastor Weaver, I saw him like out here and I, I, I just knew he was Pastor Weaver. <laughs> like, like I, no, I've never met this man in my life, but somehow he came over and like good, gave me a noogie and I was like, this is Pastor Weaver. Like, <laughs> this is the man I've heard about, you know? I just knew it was him. So uh, I love that man already, you know? Uh, Pastor Jeff and Jeannie, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I, I, I feel like you, 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 the both of you just have like parent vibes. And so uh, you have a black son now, so don't know if you knew that. His name is Manny, so going to be hard getting rid of me. I love you guys a lot. I love you guys a lot. Um, let's get into the word. Anybody ready for the word? Let's get into the word. Let's get into the word. 
We're going to go to John chapter 5. We're going to go to John chapter 5. And um, I, I want to speak right on the tail end of, of this fresh wind, the, the Holy Spirit emphasis that we've had. Um, and and I want to I wanna lay a foundation tonight. Anybody plan on being here like all the way till Wednesday? You ain't missing a service. Come on. Ain't missing a service. All right. That, there we go. So we're going to go on a journey together, okay? If you can only be here tonight or one night or two nights, that's fine. But for everyone who's going to be here five nights, we're just going to build and build and build and build. So uh, tonight, I, I, I firmly believe that sometimes there's, we're believing God for miracles. Come on, Pastor Jeff said it from the stage. We're, we believe in God for miracles. Come on, anybody believe in the miraculous power of God? I believe in miracles. I believe in miracles, signs, wonders. I believe in all of it, okay? Um, I found in 20, I've been preaching for 20 years. Uh, I started preaching when I was 13 years old. So, um, so in, my, in my life of just ministering to people and pastoring and preaching, I found sometimes, um, Pastor Jeff, that sometimes we're believing God for an outer miracle, but sometimes disease or sickness or whatever that out, outer manifestation is, is actually linked to inner healing that's not yet complete in our life. Um, it's funny, I was like 18 years old, and uh, the bishop at our church, he's 75, and uh, he's, he's a character. Reminds me of Pastor Weaver, actually. And... Uh, I remember one time he's praying for deliverance, praying for deliverance for a woman that was at our church. Um, and he's like, the Holy Spirit's got power. <laughs> if there's an issue, there's a demonic manifestation or something like that, like the Holy Ghost got power. The name of Jesus has power. And we're just bumping up against like, it's just resistance. And um, Bishop stopped praying, stopped speaking in tongues, looked at the woman and said, do you have unforgiveness in your heart? And the woman goes, absolutely. And the moment she began to forgive, deliverance came immediately. Because we can believe God for outer miracles all day long. Um, but, but I kind of want to get to like the root stuff. Because um, miracles can happen. Actually, it's very easy for God to do miracles. You know what's hard is for our human heart to transform. That's hard. That's difficult. That, that's the hard stuff. <laughs> miracles sometimes in church we make the signs miracles and wonders like that's the advanced level stuff nope not not really <laughs> for God that's like that's you don't even have to for real like all throughout the gospels whether or not people believed in Jesus or not they still got miracles I mean the miracles that's the easy part the church in Corinth they were experiencing miracles but there was divisions in the church and gossiping and yeah, come on and a good amen right there so the miracles is 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 to god it's like pinky finger like yo oh, look yo somebody got healed you know it's like miracles are not hard for god they're hard for our rational mind um but they're not hard for the lord but if the if the oh boy the 13 year old you is still living in there in your soul unchecked like if the 17-year-old you who was abused or molested is still sitting on the throne of your life and you never forgave the uncle who molested you or like, see, we can pray for miracles all day. But if you wall everybody off and don't let God actually get to that part of you, the part of you that's broken, the part of you who's disappointed, the part of you who is bitter and angry, the part of you who if we rub you the wrong way you'll show us that part of you like if we don't get there um then we 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 can't miracles aren't what you need <laughs> um so so i want to go to john chapter five because jesus rolls up on a guy who's been paralyzed for a long time he's been laying on a mat he's at the pool of bethesda this is john chapter five i'm pretty sure we're going to start reading it should be up on the screens we're going to start reading at verse one um, I'm black, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> that means like I call and response when it comes to like reading Bible verses. So, if there's a word I don't say, that's your turn to kind of say the word that I don't say. Because in black church, it's just a, everything's a choir. <laughs> Not just the choir. Everything's a choir, right? Everything is very communal. So, um, and uh, yeah, you know, we're all black today. So, anyway. Uh, here we go. Sometime... That was good. There we go. Okay. Come on. Let's do that again. Sometime. Later. Okay. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. 
for one of the Jewish festivals. Next verse. Uh, now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a... Rule. Come on, a... Rule. Which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Next verse. Here... A great number of disabled people used to lie. Okay, now the Bible's gonna tell us that the disabled people that are here at the pool are in categories, very organized, okay? So we got three distinct categories the, Blind. the, Blind. the, Blind. okay, now it's gonna skip to verse five. That's because there is no verse four, okay? So don't freak out. <laughs> the King James Version actually has a verse four here, the NIV doesn't. And the King James, let me tell you what the King James says right here, is that they believed, okay, the people that were at this pool, they believed that every so often an angel would come down, an angel would dip his finger in the pool, and whoever gets to the pool first, when the waters were stirred, would be healed, okay? That's what verse 4 in the King James Version says. The NIV, the ESV, the NRSV don't have a verse 4. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's it's just some manuscripts have it, some don't. Don't, don't worry. Here we go. Verse 5. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Here we go. Let's keep going. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Okay, here we go. Here's where we got to stop. Because... I don't know, Jesus, but context clues would suggest that the guy is paralyzed. He's at a pool with a bunch of other paralyzed people. There's clearly Jesus knows the superstition or the rumor that an angel comes down, touches the pool, that the water ripples and that people get in. Like, uh, Jesus! This is a dumb question. <laughs> come on, let's just be real. Come on, come on. Like, it's almost like an offensive question. What do you mean do I want to get healed? It's like the whole reason I'm here. Do I want to get healed? Do I want to get well? Do I want to get well? See, ah. Uh, but see, how many people been in church a long enough time to know Jesus doesn't ask questions to get information. If Jesus is asking you a question, it's actually because uh, he's making a statement. He's like my mom. <laughs> Jesus is like my mom. I have uh, my mom, okay, she's awesome. And like my mom, are you a mom? I don't, I don't know if you do this, okay. My mom, you'll tell me, you'll be honest with me. <laughs> like let's say I show up, you know, to like an event. My mom will say to me, as a question, oh, is that what you're wearing? <laughs> and I'm thinking, clearly you know. This is what I'm, this is not a question. What you are saying is you'd like me to change. That, that is what that question means. Come on, anybody got a mom like mine? Anybody, come on, come on. It, it's not, someone said wife, <laughs> okay. <laughs> That, come on, a question is being asked, but the question is really a statement. statement. You hear Jesus? Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Because you can be in the right place, around the right people, for a long time, and still remain in the same condition. Because Jesus says, just because you're at the pool does not tell me that you actually want to get well. You can be in the right place, but have the wrong posture and never get healed. Why? Because healing is not about a pool. Healing is not about a building. Healing is not about where you are, but healing is about the direction of your heart and whether or not you want to be healed. Not do you want me to heal you, but do you want to be healed? Are you willing to do what you've never done so that you can have the life that you've never had? Are you willing to be open and honest and vulnerable? Are you down to be healed do you want to be healed 
Do you want to be healed? Because guess what? You can fool everybody else. To everybody else. It's like, yeah, here's a guy who wants to be healed. He's at the pool with a mat. He's paralyzed. Everyone clearly wants to be healed here. But you can't fool Jesus. Jesus rolls right up to this dude. Do you want to be healed? <laughs> I took a trip to Israel a year or two ago. Can't remember. And, and when we were in Israel, we visited this pool. We visited the pool of Bethesda. And it's kind of like when, you're, when you go to Israel, things begin to make a little bit more sense. You kind of get oriented. And the pool of Bethesda is on this main road that everybody would have traveled on. And so the pool is perfectly situated. Uh oh, I'm gonna step on some toes. For pity. Because if you're paralyzed, this is the perfect place to beg for money. So Jesus asked a very poignant question. Are you sure you wanna be healed? Because buddy, guess what? If I heal you, you're going to have to deal with the consequences of being healed. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Because if I heal you, you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to leave this pool and get a job. <laughs> and take responsibility for your life. And stop blaming people. And tell yourself a different story. And rewire your mind see if I heal you uh oh see if this is a youth event I'd say see if Jesus actually heals you you know what will happen you'll have no excuse for why you date stupid people no more <laughs> see if God heals you of all your daddy wounds you can't blame your daddy wounds on why you date idiots hello can I go a little deeper can we go a little deeper you know, healing hurts. I need, I need this to sink in. Healing hurts. My friend Sam Perkins, he was here last time that I, I was in Iowa. And um, Sam, when we turned 30, for whatever reason, he didn't get the memo that we stopped doing physical activities. Like, <laughs> I turned 30, I sat down. That's it, I became a sedentary person. This is my cardio, you know, I'm sweating. This is great, this is enough. <laughs> Sam continued like playing basketball, playing flag football. I'm like, bro, we're 30, <laughs> what is going on? And Sam, one day he's playing pickup basketball and Sam said it felt like someone shot him in his ankle and he tore his Achilles limped off the court and I'm just I'm just like I got a phone call because this was happening at the youth facility I was a youth pastor at the time they're like Sam's down Sam's down I'm like take him to a hospital what am I gonna do I'm not a doctor you know he has emergency surgery the next day the morphine finally wears off and you want to know what Sam says the healing of his Achilles hurt more than the initial injury of his Achilles. Because healing, see, see, see? We can romanticize healing. God healed me. But no, guess what? Healing's a painful process. Okay, okay, okay. Can we go a little deeper? Yeah. Jesus asked an interesting question to Lazarus' sisters. He says, where did you bury him? Where'd you put Lazarus? You know, this is the kind of Jesus who makes you uncover all the stuff that you hid. Can you imagine? Can you imagine you're in the middle of a funeral? I don't know if anybody's like mourned someone, but it comes in waves. You just cry and then it's almost like there's peace and then like a memory comes back and you start crying again. 
And there's a certain level of closure you get, like at the gravesite when they go into the ground. Like it's just as humans, like we just experience a certain level of closure. Imagine, days have gone by. Jesus is nowhere to be found. Lazarus dies. They waited for Jesus to show up. Lazarus dies. So what do they do? They put Lazarus in a tomb. Then they put him in the tomb. That's what? Closure. What does Jesus say? All the stuff you closed up. All the stuff you buried. All those memories you forgot. All that pain that you put behind a stone wall. Open that up because I can't heal it unless you stop hiding it. I can't heal it. And you buried it so far deep in your subconscious. You buried the pain. You buried that first marriage. You buried that first miscarriage. You buried it. You buried it. You buried it. And now you're 40 years old and you can't figure out why there's some seemingly unconnected area of your life where you can't experience peace. And God walks in and he goes, do you want to be healed? And the reason he asked the question is because he's saying, you can't blame me for all the junk that's about to come up because healing hurts. Healing's not easy. If you're going to be a healed person, woo. See, healing body parts, God is like, easy. Healing your identity? Not so easy. Uh Uh-oh. Can we go a little deeper? Okay, here we go. Let's go to the next verse. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Now, this is where the Bible's funny. Because the Bible has already told us the only people at this pool are blind, lame, and paralyzed people. Bruh, who is beating you to the pool? Like, who, like are you telling me? Are you tell, Like, the blind guys are like, yeah, I got it. Like, what? I'm mixing in a little humor because, you know, Candy's good with medicine. Because it's about to get real. Verse 7 represents the story that this man has told himself. Have you ever asked somebody a yes or no question? Simple question. Do you want to get healed? All the man had to say is, yes, sir. Nope. He breaks out into a story. Have you ever, you know you're talking to someone with like problems. When you're like, you're doing all right? They're like, well, actually, no. It's like, whoa. A little more than I bargained for. Jesus is like, hey. Do you want to get well healed? Different versions of the Bible, same, same idea. The guy breaks into this story. I have no one to help me. Every time the water is stirred, someone else goes down ahead of me. It's their fault. It's not my fault. It's their fault. No one likes to help me. They overlook me because I'm a woman. No, 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 it's, you know, America's racist. That's why I can't get ahead. All types of things we tell ourselves. My spouse keeps hiding the keys. No. (laughs) You lose your keys. (laughs) Listen to me. There's nothing more powerful than the story you tell yourself. There is nothing more powerful than the story you tell yourself. At some point, you are going to have to adopt the narrative that you are the head only and not the tail. That you are above only and never beneath. That you are more than a conqueror because of his love. That greater is he that is in you than he that's within the world. That by his stripes, you are healed. That whatever door God opens for you, nobody can shut it. Poverty can't shut it. Racism can't shut it. Hatred can't shut it. Nothing can close the doors that God opens 
for you and what God has for you is for you. You're not playing musical chairs with a bunch of other people and there's a little bit of blessing and a lot of people competing. You don't have to compete with anybody. You don't have to, the story you tell yourself, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. That's the narrative. That's the narrative. Listen to this. Joseph, Joseph says, Joseph, not God. I need you to get this. Not God. Joseph says, what the enemy meant for evil, God meant it for good. You see, it's important that this is what Joseph said because this is what Joseph was telling himself. My brothers didn't put me here. The devil didn't even put me here. God put me here. The story you tell yourself. The story you tell yourself. What story are you telling yourself? Three years ago, I said to my wife, we are parents. Period. That's the story we're telling ourselves. I don't want pity from God. Woo. Okay, here we go. About to step on some toes. Because you, at every point, have a decision to make. You can get pity from God or power from God, but you cannot get both. You cannot get both. And every time you opt for pity, you immediately disqualify yourself from experiencing power from God. We want the windows of heaven to open up and the fire of God to pour out and the spirit to move. The spirit comes in power. But we have so many people who are so weak-minded that they'd rather have pity than experience the power of the Holy Ghost. I want the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit that doesn't just anoint me in here, but transforms me so that when I leave out the front doors of the church, I become the kind of person that attracts people to God because my life is whole and I'm not broken and I don't say toxic things and I don't repeat a narrative that makes me the victim. Woo! I'm preaching good. I'm preaching real good. The story you tell yourself. Can we go a little deeper with that? Yes, please. Okay. I like that. Boom. <laughs> you can't control what happens, but you can control the story you tell yourself. Yeah. That's right. You can't control events. You can't control that someone got cancer. You can't control you got unemployed. You can't control that a pandemic happened. You, you can't control the, the world. You know what you can't control? The story you tell yourself. It's funny, I was a, you, you, Pastor, you're, you're going to love this, this is great, uh, you know, we ran a youth conference for years, you know, and you know, you, you guys don't ever, you get along with your youth staff perfectly, there's never any strife, it's perfect, you and Zach and Luke and August, there's never any kind of disagreement, I wish that was my case in North Carolina, but I'll just covet y'all's relationship here in Iowa, we had ran a youth conference, and our youth conference was like really successful. Like year one, 500 youth and young adults show up. Year two, 1,000 youth and young adults show up. Year three, 1,500 youth and young adults show up. I mean, we're crushing it, crushing it. One of the largest youth gatherings and young adult gatherings in the state of North Carolina. One day, my pastor calls me. Yeah. We're not going to do that conference anymore. Oh. Uh, you ever just be shocked? I know this never happens with your, you guys. It's just me and my pastor. <laughs> yeah. You're just not going to do that. You're just not, not, not going to do it. Well, pastor, you know, we already have people booked. People have like, purchase flights and hotels and all that good stuff. Yeah, you can figure it out. <laughs> We're just not gonna do it. Yeah, but I, I booked like John Gray, like he's kind of a big deal. Like, 
a book like Sarah Jakes Roberts, like, uh, uh, like Jesus Culture's book, you know? Yeah, you can figure it out. It's fine. All right, bye. Whew. <laughs> what story am I about to tell myself? Because I could tell myself the story. The youth conference just got so big that my pastor got jealous of me. Because that's a version of the story that I could tell myself. That's a version of a story that a lot of youth pastors tell themselves, which is why we have a lot of churches that are split off from, anyway, never mind, not in Iowa. I got myself together. I didn't say anything to my wife, because gossip is still gossip, even if it's gossip to your spouse. But anyway, that's a whole other sermon. Didn't say anything to my spouse. I like waited, I processed. I waited like a week and a half, two weeks. When I finally talked to my youth team and my wife, here's the words that came out of my mouth. I feel like the Holy Spirit wants us to put this on the altar. That's the story I told myself. Because any other story would have made my pastor the villain and me a victim. Why would I choose to react when I could respond with wisdom? Why would I do that? I'm healing marriages in the room right now because it's a story you tell yourself about your spouse. You don't know why they do what they do. You only know what they do. And since the human brain loves reasoning, you fill in the gap for yourself and you tell yourself a story for why they do what they do, not just what they do. Uh oh. And you tell yourself a story. They do that because. The moment you say because, you're wrong. You're wrong. Even if you're right, you're wrong. Because only God is in the place to judge. The moment you start judging somebody's intentions, you have gotten in God's chair. And you have made an idol out of your opinion. And then you start telling yourself a story. And you know what happens next? A self-fulfilling prophecy starts happening. Every single time they don't say hi to you, you're like, see, I told you, girl, they don't like me. Or they don't know your name. <laughs> but the story you've told your self is now governing how you feel, your mood. It governs how you see them. Yeah, I don't see, they don't like me. No, they're not even thinking about you. I bet you they're not thinking about you. But you know what you've done? You told yourself a story. You tell yourself a story as you're scrolling through social media. Man, their family's so perfect. We, what? Boo boo, it's an edited photo. <laughs> but you're choosing. This is not automatic. You can stop it. This is not out of your control. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. That's the story he told himself. Here we go. Now I get to have a little fun. Okay. I've stepped on toes long enough. Y'all like, please get off my big toe. <laughs> get off of, I got a bunion right there and you are on it. Please get off my toe. Here we go. I wish I could talk to this guy. I wish I could teleport back into the first century and talk to this guy. Because you know what I would say to this guy? I'd say, hey, bruh, guess what? You're not the only paralyzed guy in the Bible. You realize that there are other paralyzed people in the Bible. There's a whole other paralyzed guy in the Bible, and he was qualified to sit at the pool just like you. But instead of sitting at the pool just like you, you want to know what he did? He got himself four friends who could walk. And one day, while they were walking around him, they decided Jesus is healing people over there at that house. And one day, because he wasn't at a pool with people who struggled with the exact same thing he struggled with, people who 
could walk, walked him right to Jesus' house, saw that there was no room in Jesus' house, got up on the roof, ripped up the roof, lowered him into the house, and the Bible says that Jesus saw their faith, not his faith, but their faith, and healed the man. I would walk up to this guy, and I would say, you're at this pool, and it's your decision to be here. I have no one to help me. Bruh, you have no one to help you because your insecurities, whoo, because you allowed your insecurities to choose your relationships. You know how triggering it is to have friends who can walk when you can't? Everything they do is a constant reminder of what you cannot do. You want to know what me and my wife did? Jesus, this was hard. We planned baby showers for our friends for the five years that we struggled to get pregnant. I babysat my friends' kids because I cannot go where I don't sew. It's not possible, it's a principle. You always, your sewing leads you. So I sold into families and I sold into fathers and I sold into, fa into mothers. I was the youth pastor at our church and in a staff meeting I said, I'll lead everything for Father's Day and my wife will do everything for Mother's Day. We're gonna bless the mothers of the church and we're gonna bless the fathers of the church. Why? Because I'm struggling to have babies. Why would I surround myself with a bunch of other people who are also struggling to have babies? So what, we can cry together? I don't need pity. I want power. I don't want pity. I want the power of God that is able to transform me and make me different. Why would I choose pity? I don't want pity. I want power. I will choose power. Every time the story you tell yourself, I'm sowing, I'm sowing, I'm sowing. This kid's about to change the world. Woof! I'm sewing. The reason I'm waiting is because clearly it's worth something. I'm so the story you tell yourself, the story you tell yourself, the people you surround yourself with. I remember being in eighth grade from the inner city of Boston. Inner city is just a code word for the ghetto. That's all that means. From the hood. My mom was pregnant at 12. Government cheese, like that was like good cheese. First pair of glasses, welfare glasses. Lived in the projects. But for whatever reason, I got a scholarship to go to Lexington Christian Academy. Two trains and a bus every day just to get to school. Woke up at 5 a.m., got on two trains and a bus to make it to school for the eight o'clock homeroom bell. I remember all of us living in one tiny little apartment. Broke. Po. Po. So po that you can't even finish the sentence. Just po. Just po. Like, had bad credit as a young adult because my parents put bills in my name as a baby. Like, po. Po. And ignorant. That's ignorant. Po and ignorant. Remember being in eighth grade. And I got invited to Chris Mills' house. Chris Mills. Well, let me tell you a little bit about Chris Mills. Chris Mills' sister was the captain of the soccer team. And one year, Chris Mills' sister invited the whole soccer team to her house, and the soccer team got stuck in their elevator and had to forfeit a game because they got stuck in Chris Mills' sister's elevator. I got invited to Chris Mills' house. I had never seen a, th that many white people. Like, I, I, like I, Chris Mills drove a BMW to school in high school. One day, Chris Mills jumped off the roof of his house onto a trampoline that was on top of the pool house. Chris Mills. And you know what I felt like at Chris Mills' house? I felt like the one kid who was paralyzed with four friends who were walking all around me. Because Chris Mills had a dad and a house 
the elevator, and you not want to know what story I told myself as an eighth grader, God would never show me something that I'm not going to walk in one day. As a 13-year-old, I told myself the story, God is exposing me to this because this is going to be my normal. I'm not going to live in the projects my whole life. I'm not going to live in the hood my whole life. I'm not going to speak incorrect English my whole life. Like, that's cool. That's not cool. One day, I am going to be wealthy. One day, I'm going to live in a gated neighborhood. One day, God is going to make me abundantly rich so that I can resource missionaries around the world. One day, God is going to open up doors for me the story you tell yourself so I never joined a gang you know why because I didn't see that as the group that reflected me because I told myself a different story what pool have you been around because you know what your pool is your pool is just a reflection of you Ooh. The people who hang out at your pool, they feel like that pool is their home. That's why they're there. Uh-oh. A paralyzed guy made a decision. I ain't hanging out at this pool. Somebody dropped, probably dropped him off of the pool of Bethesda and he was like, nah, I ain't doing this. I got four friends back home who can walk. And I'm just gonna, they're gonna play soccer around me. And I, I'm just gonna look. <laughs> It'll work out. You know what happened? One day homeboy started walking because he surrounded himself with walkers. That's why he was walking. I tell the young adults in my church all the time, you want to be married, hang out with married people. Not even that hard. You're single because you hang out with single people. Uh-oh. You want to be wealthy, hang out with wealthy people. You want to be healed? Hang out with healed people because all of your passive aggressive tendencies will get called out. You start acting passive aggressive around somebody who's actually healed and they're going to say, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? And you have a decision to make. You can let the people who know how to walk model walking for you or you can hang out at the pool that you're comfortable at. With your family of origin who taught you how to be passive aggressive. What good is God's family if God's family is just as toxic as your family? What's the point? The thing that attracted me to the family of God is that the family of God wasn't dysfunctional like my family. Hello. That's why youth ministry is important. Because we're helping young people to get acclimated to faith even if they come from families that are full of doubt. We're giving them a different place. You don't have to drink from that pond. You don't have to drink from that well. You don't have to congregate around that pond. You can be different. You're not tied to your last name. You're tied to the name Jesus and new blood is running through your veins. That's the whole point. Here we go. Verse, next verse. <laughs> Jesus said to him, get up then. This is savage Jesus. <laughs> I need you to get this. Most times in the Gospels, you want to know what Jesus does to heal people? He touches them. But this man had been getting handouts his whole life. Jesus doesn't touch him at all. You know what Jesus says? You want it? Go ahead, get up then. Get up. You sick of being anxious? Get up then. You tired of being depressed? Go ahead, get up. You tired of telling yourself a story where you're always the victim and they're always the bad guy and you're always the loser and they're always, the, then get up. You're tired of thinking in a way that is toxic and dysfunctional? Then get up. You're tired of just being in a rango and you wanna be a Christian? Then go ahead, get up. You're tired of living life at a mediocre level when you can live the abundant life that God's promised for you? Then go ahead and get up. What are, are, what are you gonna do? Because I'm not helping you. Ooh, this is grown man Jesus. We ain't ready for this Jesus. Listen, Jesus says this, I will heal you, but I will not help you. 
I'll transform you, but I will not enable you. Won't do it. I won't do it. Because the goal is for you to be what? Mature and complete, not lacking anything. So God says, I'll heal you. I'm going to heal you. But I'm going to heal you from the inside out. I have to change your story before I can change anything about you physically. Get up. Oh, I don't know who I'm preaching to. Get up. Get up. 2020 was a hard year. I hear you. Guess what? Get up. You got laid off. You got foreclosed on. Okay, guess what? Get up. Yeah, but I'm still struggling with my. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get up. Up. I hear you, I hear your story, I feel your pain, but do you want to know what my response is? Get up, get up, get up out of your excuses and out of your story and out of what you've told yourself. You have the power to get up. Here's what I love, that the man had to try. <laughs> Jesus just told a man who cannot move to get up. This is almost like, he couldn't have done this in 2021. This would have been, he would have got canceled. Jesus would have got canceled. <laughs> Jesus would have got canceled. Jesus. <laughs> like, no, no more Jesus. <laughs> Telling disabled people to get up. No. Just get up. What I love, the guy has to go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here's what I love about God. This is why the Bible says we co-labor with Christ. Because here's what happens. As the guy does what's in his power, the Holy Ghost hits him. And now God adds his super to your natural. That's how we get supernatural. You don't get supernatural when you're not even willing to do the natural. How is God going to add super onto your finances when tithing is just the natural? That ain't even super. What are you talking about? That's the bare bit minimum. When you do the natural, God goes, oh, I'm going to throw gas on that fire. Oh, I'm going to add my superpowers to all the natural things that you're doing. We can't over-spiritualize spiritual things. No, God goes, you do what's natural. You worship me. You create an environment. You can't control the spirit being poured out, but you can control whether you lift your hands in a worship service. So you control the natural. Let God control the super. And as the man attempted to get up, God's supernatural power began to hit him and this is how God partners with us I want a God who partners with you I want a God who doesn't just start revival but sustains revival come on for generations because revival comes through healed people healed in your mind healed in your thinking healed in your soul and healed in your body I'm believing God for supernatural power Supernatural power. My dad. Whoo! Somebody can come play keys. We're gonna go into worship in a moment. Everything sounds more spiritual when people play keys. <laughs> <clears throat> Whoo! I'm gonna be vulnerable with y'all because I'm gonna be with y'all for five whole days. <laughs> My dad took me to a crack house for the first time when I was five years old. My dad served an 18-year prison sentence. He's been addicted to crack cocaine since I was six months old. Took me to a crack house when I was five. The reason I remember it is because it was the night before my parents got married. So it's a distinct memory. I can still remember the smell, the walls, feeling unsafe, feeling uncovered. And I remember my parents' argument about the whole scenario. So I got older, never felt like my dad had validated me. He was in the house, out of the house. Because addicts, addicts, it's hard when you're an addict because instead of loving people and using things, addicts love a thing. So they use people to get the thing that they love. So I remember getting older and I realized, man, 
I got to get into counseling or therapy or something because every relationship I try to get into falls apart. I don't trust my pastor. I, I, I feel numb. I just knew something was off. And you know what's crazy? As I got into therapy, as I got into counseling, I could hear my father's voice telling me, you're weak. If you were strong, you wouldn't even get into therapy. Isn't it crazy how the person who initially hurt you can also keep you bound? Oh, Jesus. I remember fighting the inner voice of Manny Arango Sr. I'm named after this guy. Fighting that voice and saying, you took me to a crack house when I was five, but you can't keep me from a therapist's office at 25. Don't work that way. Because God is the God over my life, not you. See, the moment we elevate somebody in our life who hurt us so much that now we can't be healed, that person has just become an idol. Anyone you cannot forgive is an idol because they hold power over you. There are some people who their parents have deceased dead, not even on the earth anymore, and they still hold power over you. You think that you need them to be alive to forgive them. No, baby, listen to me. You need to forgive them because forgiveness is for you. You don't give forgiveness to them, you give forgiveness to you. So I'm sitting in this therapist's office. Pastor Jeff, this moment literally marked me. And the therapist starts asking me about my dad. And I'm saying about my dad, my dad did more damage with his words than even his actions. I can still remember the negative things that my dad said to me. I can remember the words that my dad spoke over me and my mother and how those words marked me. I'm 25 years old and these words have marked me. What he said, what he didn't say, what I wanted him to say. He left us in the house for weeks on end with no food. My mom was disabled and, and long story, but my dad just did a number. But nothing was worse than what he said. He was the kind of person who like, you knew he was lying, but you could rope him, like he could rope you in. He was a drug addict, but he was also a professional contractor. So he could get $20,000 of the down payment for a job, never show up to do the work. He was just, I mean, his personality could light up a room. He was charismatic. He had a way with words. You knew he was lying. You just wanted to believe him. He was just that kind of person. I said all this to the therapist. Uh-oh. You want to know what the therapist said to me? Sounds like your father left you with a powerful set of gifts. I was like, how about you put your little notebook down <laughs> and listen to the words that are coming out of my mouth. My father didn't leave me. I was angry. Oh, I was angry. I was hot. I was like, I don't even want to be here. I don't even want to be here. And I pay you. I don't pay you to confront me or insult me. I pay you to rub my back and hand me the Kleenex. That's what I pay you to do. <laughs> pay you to insult me? You want to know what that therapist said to me? Manny, you could either get power out of this session or pity out of this session. If you want pity, I'm not your therapist. But if you want power, I'm going to ask you one more time, can you describe your father to me? I said, my dad, because talk his way into anything, talk his way out of anything. My dad was manipulative with his words. He was hypnotic with his words. My dad, uh, he was mesmerizing. His gift, he had a gift of gab. His personality could light up a room. I don't know, it was, just, it was a superpower. The therapist said, yeah, it sounds like your father left you with a powerful set of gifts. I said, Doc, I... I'm frustrated. I don't want to walk out of this session. I need you to like help me understand what you're talking about. The therapist asked me this question. He said, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a preacher. 
The therapist said, then it sounds like you can talk people into anything, talk people out of anything. It sounds like you're manipulative with your words. It sounds like your words are your superpower. It sounds like your father blessed you. It sounds like your father left you a powerful set of gifts. It sounds like you can talk people out of hell and into heaven. It sounds like you can talk people out of depression and into joy. It sounds like you can talk people out of anxiety and into peace. You need to call your father and tell your father thank you because you've traveled around the world preaching because of a gift that your father put on the inside of you and you hate your father so much that you cannot love the gift that your father put on the inside of you and so many of us we hate the seed that our parent put in us because we don't like the fruit that our parent had but at the end of the day you better realize that if God can use Joseph's brothers or people who don't love you then God can use whatever person you're angry at or bitter at or broke up with you or didn't give you an opportunity or didn't open up a door the story you tell yourself and I have decided I will always tell myself the story that God is for me that he is not against me that he's watching over me called my father that night I hadn't spoken to my father in years said hey thanks my dad was super confused. What? He's like, thank you. Thank you for that time you left me. First grade. It was me and all my friends. And then it was me and like two friends. And then it was like me and the principal. Then me and a police officer. Because my dad was on a drug bench. Forgot to pick me up from school. I said, thank you. You let angels encamp around me that day. I remember feeling the presence of God that day as a six-year-old. Thank you. If you hadn't abandoned me, God wouldn't have been able to protect me. Thank you. Thanks for leaving me and my mom in the house with no food. You know why? Because a random stranger walked to our house and said the Holy Ghost told us to bring groceries to this house. And I wouldn't know a God who can open up doors like that had you not left me hungry. Thank you. Thank you for every gift that you gave me. Thank you for all the things that the enemy meant for evil. You know why? Because God turns them around for good. God does that. Only God can do that. Here's the question tonight. Do you want to be healed? 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 As we go into a time, an altar call time, I want to lay hands on people and pray with people who you're like, I need to get healed. Oh, there's some stuff down deep. I need to get healed. We can deal with the surface stuff. That stuff's not hard. But the reason that Moses has a stutter is because he's got an anger problem. We can heal the stutter. But tonight, can, can we do some open heart surgery? Can we get down to the root of what's going on? You know, it's funny. In order to really accept being a dad, I had to start talking to my biological dad. I remember telling him that we were having a kid and, and the Holy Spirit saying to me, okay, are you ready for the potential that he may be a better grandfather than he was a father? Is that gonna bother you? Is that gonna trigger you? How healed are you? Do you wanna be healed? Do you wanna be healed? If you're in the room tonight, and I don't even know how long I've been preaching, but for however long I've been preaching, you're glad I'm talking, but you're also angry with me. If that's you, you're like, man, you are in my business. But I need to get healed. If that's you, come on, just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. I want to know who I'm praying for. Who am I praying for? There we go. Come on. Come on. Bitterness, unforgiveness, resentment, hurt to the story you've told yourself. There's something down in there, and it's a block. It keeps blocking you from opportunities. There's something down in there that's just toxic. And maybe you're in the room and you're like, man, I keep praying for physical healing. It's not happening. And maybe tonight the Holy Spirit's revealing 
well, actually, there's some invisible stuff that needs to get healed before visible things can get healed. If that's you, come on. I want to give you an opportunity. Throw your hand up at me. Throw your hand up at me. Throw your hand up at me. I see your hand. I see your hand. Oh, Holy Ghost, we need you in the room. Oh, Holy Spirit, we need you to be a comforter in the room. God, we ask that you walk through the aisles, that God, that you would be in this room. If that's you, come on. Maybe you've resisted even throwing up your hand. Maybe you're like, what's the point in me throwing up my hand? I want to give you one last invitation. Come on, raise your hand right, right where you are, right where you are. Come on. There's a story you've been telling yourself, a narrative you've been telling yourself. And you've enjoyed, you, you'll, even, you'll start telling people your story. And for you, it's not even you being vulnerable. You just vent and you don't even know how to stop. You just vent and you just, this is what we're going to do. This is oil, ain't it? Amen. As the worship team plays, let's just go ahead and sing. Can we all stand up on our feet? Can we all stand up? Can we all stand up all over?